when I read the first paragraph of the introduction, it brought me back to my economics education in the university and the most important course I ever had, which was Econ 101. All of a sudden, I understood the markets for exactly what they were, and it came down to the irrefutable law of supply and demand. And that set me on, that set my ship on this path that I knew what I was here to do, and I was teach this to my brothers and sisters for the rest of my life, and, and I've done that since that point, and still doing it, even up to this moment. One of the important parts of the equation of point and figure technical analysis is relative strength. And relative strength is a simple calculation, but back 30 years ago, we didn't, we had a Tandy 3000, uh, and that's all we had. And I mean, that was floppy disks. Many of you uh, listening to this don't know what a floppy disk is. Um, that's what we use. It's in the Smithsonian Institute probably now. It doesn't run anything. And uh, that's what we were using. So when we had to do relative strength charts, we were able to do maybe 200 per week because it, re it requires basic fifth grade division. And I wouldn't even call that fifth grade math. I'd, I'd call it fifth grade arithmetic because we do this in the most simple, straightforward way of relative strength, dividing something by, by something. Take, for instance, we'll talk about Coca-Cola and Pepsi. If I want to know which one is the best relative strength, I'm going to divide the price of one of them by the other. That gives me a number, and I can then plot it on a point and figure chart. So this is very simple stuff. Cammy DeRosier, my right hand here at, uh, at Dorsey Wright, and I went into a seventh grade class at Gates Elementary School and talked them this in 40 minutes. So kids like this... Uh, catch on in, in, in 40 minutes. Adults take probably more a whole weekend. You have to be programmed in how they think things work. So let's begin to look at this. The calculation is simply investment A over investment B. So it can be anything. You may want to be comparing Indonesia to the, the major market index. You may want to compare France to Germany. You may want to compare IBM to Coca-Cola. It doesn't make any difference. Back then, we were able to, 30 years ago, we were able to do this division and, and make relative strength charts on maybe 200 in a week, 200 stocks in a week. And that was the rite of passage for Tammy to do these by hand. Today, because of computer technology, we update probably 15 million every night. And that's absolutely amazing to me. I mean, I, I remember the day when we did the arithmetic by hand, and now 15 million a night. We compare anything to anything. The computer systems we have are just second to none. So when I look at the point and figure chart, it's made of X's and O's. Now, this is a relative strength chart you're looking at here, but still, if it was a trend chart, it would look the same because Charles Dow created this methodology back in the late 1800s, and he was primarily a fundamentalist, but he understood that the reason for price movement was the irrefutable law of supply and demand, and he created a methodology called figuring back then, in which instead of the X's and O's you see in the chart here, he wrote the price of the stock. So it could be 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and then the stock pulls back. He switched columns and reversed the order, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, and then the stock starts moving forward. He shifts columns, reverses the order, 21, 22, 23, and so on. So what you see here is, is in the early 1900s, they changed this methodology from figuring to X's and O's because this way you can clearly see where demand is in control versus where supply is in control. A column of X's exceeding a previous column of X's is a buy signal. Now, why is that? Stock comes up to a particular level and supply takes over. Things in motion will tend to stay in motion until acted upon by an opposite force. Well, when demand is in control, that's when things stay in motion. And when it's acted upon by an opposite force, which would be supply, supply overtakes demand, and the downward move is on, and that's how the charts are formed. Things move up and down. They don't go straight up. So what happens here is you have a signal, a buy signal, in a relative strength chart. This chart is created by dividing one thing by another. We then get a number. That number is then point pl uh, plotted on this chart. It looks like a trend chart, but it really is a relative strength chart. It's comparing, it's comparing the movement of each one to each other. So these are long-term in nature. Keep in mind that relative strength chart signals can last two to two and a half years. 
So the buy signal is the column of X's exceeding the previous column of X's, as you can see there. Now let's look at the next signal. All of a sudden, it reverses into a column of O's. So we would say long term, the stock is positive on a relative strength basis. It's on a buy signal. However, short term, it's moved into a column of O's, which tells me short term, uh, the, the opposite is true. When you're on a buy signal, you own the numerator. So in other words, if I was looking at IBM uh, versus Pepsi, IBM is the numerator, Pepsi is the denominator. I divide the price of Pepsi into IBM. I get a number. I then plot that on the chart. When it's on a buy signal, it's saying own the numerator. When it's on a sell signal, it's saying own the denominator. However, in between there, you have that short-term move where it's in a column of those. And keep in mind, these are long-term. They can last two to two and a half years. So a reversal into a column of those could be the beginning of something very serious, or it could be just a short-term move. This is where you come in as the advisor to think intelligently about this for your customer. This is why you earn your fee. Although this is giving you great information, you're part of the equation too. So reversal into a column of O's might bring me back into my option realm where I may sell a call against that, that particular stock. There's a multiplicity of things that you can do with it, but you're the advisor, you're earning your fee, and you're, and you're making yourself necessary to your customer. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, make yourself necessary to somebody. That's what you have to do as an advisor. Make, not just come to work and enjoy work and do well and have fun and you'll never work another day in your life and those old cliches. Make yourself necessary to someone, and this is how you do it. In this case, all of a sudden, those column of O's continue on down, and we'll see these in a, in a, in a, in a moment. It gives that sell signal at the bottom there. That tells me long-term now this uh, a stock or whatever you have, ETF or fund or whatever it may be that you're looking at, a bond, convertible bond, could be anything, uh, is, is negative. And next, you have a column of O's that exceeds the previous column of O's. That's a long-term sell signal, but it has reversed back into a column of X's. Now, we're going to see this in just a moment in Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Let's go ahead and jump over. Well, we'll hit that in a couple minutes. Here's, here's Bank of America uh, versus the Standard & Poor's Equal Weight Index. So you'll notice all of the different changes here. And this is the way it happens. Many, many years are involved here. I mean, you can see just at the bottom of 2010, which is halfway through the chart, all the way through 2018, um, The first change there, which is circled in red, is a sell signal saying own the denominator, not the numerator. Notice how S&P equal weight is down 10.7% during this period and Bank of America down 65. Although you would have lost money by switching over to the equal weight of S&P 500, much less on a relative basis than if you owned Bank of America. The next column of X's, as we just saw, uh, uh, column of X's exceeding a previous column of X's is a buy signal on the numerator in which you would own Bank of America, America at this point. And you can see that during that period of green, it's up 132% versus 79% in S&P equal weight. Up 79% in S&P equal weight is, is a fantastic return also. But if you're indexing and you're saying, look, I just want to own an index, um, you're missing out on good, uh, good potential. Next thing you know, you go into a sell signal August 10th of 2010. It remains in that until um, March 23rd, 2012. So a couple of years go by, and uh, Bank of America loses 27%. S&P equal weight um, is up 25.8%. And lastly, you have a column of X's, <coughs> excuse me, where it seems the previous column of X's, <coughs> that's a buy signal, we're just saying own the numerator. So again, you're going to own Bank of America, and that takes you right into the end of September, where we are now, <clears throat> 1st of October, and Bank of America is up 199% versus 106 in the S&P equal weight. And 106... ...go out there 
have ever taken um, the Pepsi challenge where you taste Coke and you taste Pepsi and blindfolded, you pick which one is which. And everyone says, oh, I can Coke it. No question about that. Well, I was at the Jefferson a few months ago, and uh, I ordered the Coca-Cola, and the Coke came, and I tasted it, and I said, this is Pepsi. No question about it. So I asked the waitress, I said, is this Pepsi-Cola? She said, no, we only deal in Coca-Cola products. So I failed the test. So let's say your customer can only own two things in the world in investing. Coke or Pepsi, that's it. That's all he's allowed to have, either Coke or Pepsi. So I can say, well, how am I going to select Coke or Pepsi? One way would be fundamentally, and, and, I, and, I, and I accept that, that fundamentals answer the question, what should I buy? Technicals answer the question, when should I buy them? <clears throat> so let's say I go to uh, Merrill Lynch and I get a research report for Coca-Cola, and it says definitely buy it. It's one of the top ranked companies. America's brand, apple pie, mom and pop, can't beat Coca-Cola. And then I go to, let's say, Morgan Stanley, and I say, give me a fundamental report on Pepsi-Cola. You're going to get the same thing. Another another all-timer company, America, apple pie, everything you can think of that you want to own. So both of them on a fundamental basis are basically equal. So now how do I choose which stock I want to own? This is where you come in and benefit to your, to your customer. I'm going to compare and contrast the relative movement of each of these against each other. So I already know fundamentally I want to own them. There's no question about it. The research report says own them, each one of them from different firms. Now which one do I select because I'm only allowed to have one? So you can see here Pepsi-Cola was the play between um, – that looks like June 11th, 2013. That's pretty small for my eyes. All the way through September 28, 2018. If we take it up to the current day, Pepsi Cola is up 35.53% versus Coke up 13.24%. So this, the chart showed you to buy the denominator, not the numerator. Well, come the end of the year, if we look at the performance year to date in Coke, Coke began to outperform Pepsi. And it took until April, four months, for it to, get, to gain enough strength to move from a column of O's to a column of X's. But now you look at the Coca-Cola's and a column of X's. And here's where you come in again. Coke is up year to date, 6.68%. Pepsi's down 6.77. The reason is unimportant. What this chart is saying that is that at least on a short-term basis, a change has taken place in a very long-term chart. So what do you do with that? That's what... That's where you come in with your customer. There may be a multiplicity of things that you could do with this. I might even buy calls on Coca-Cola. But there, there are a number of things you can do knowing that on a short-term basis, it's changed now to owning the numerator, not the denominator. I love these. I mean, I, 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 I look at these matrices um, every single day. Dow Jones Matrix 3. If somebody said, look, I'm interested not just in Coke and Pepsi, I'm interested in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Well, our system will take the Dow Jones Industrial Average, put it into a matrix, and make every one of those stocks arm wrestle on a relative basis against each other one. So I'm going to have to create 900 relative strength charts to know where the strength is in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And here it is right here. Apple Computers ranked number one, Microsoft Corporation number two. Interesting. Apple is much more volatile. To Microsoft, Microsoft has become a long-term kind of high-yield play. You have United Healthcare Group, fantastic company, Visa, and Nike. So if you ask me, out of the Dow Jones, Tom, what, what stocks would you buy? And I was back in production, customer calls, said I want to own the Dow Jones, which, which ones should I own? I'm going to tell you those right there. Apple, Microsoft, United Health, Visa, and Nike. Plain and simple. And on our system... You can, we will run this program for you, and we run probably 80 different models that will email you when a change takes place. This is where your future is. Um, I'm telling you right now, if I was back as an advisor or a broker or whatever you want to call it, this is what I would be doing is I'd be utilizing these matrices and models so that the system, so that I can explain to the customer exactly how this works, works as I'm doing with you now, and then I can let the system do it. So you should be able to run a billion-dollar portfolio 
from a cruise ship with an iPhone. Plain and simple. Strongest group, weakest group, speaks for itself. Okay, let's look at a picture of Apple versus IBM. You can see the buy signals that take place there. Look at Apple versus Exxon Mobil, same thing. Um, Apple versus its covered up, Coca-Cola, same thing. So you see the buy signal in the beginning here. That's where it, it has, it, periodically you've had short-term changes where it's gone into a column of those, but long-term it has just continued straight up. So Apple has been the play over IBM plain and simple. You look at January there, which will be a number of years ago, Apple versus Exxon Mobil, definitely the play, and Apple versus Coca-Cola. You can see where that column of X's exceeded that column and went into a bicycle. This is intoxicating when you think about it and showing it to a customer what you do and why you do it. So what can we expect from relative strength? It's a means for identifying market leadership, plain and simple. So when you look at, at a matrix of international sector, a matrix of the materials sector, a matrix of any sector that you want to look at, it identifies the leadership there. An adaptive tactical risk management tool. The risk management in, in that when it tells you I need to move from one thing to another or the relative strength gets to a point where in the model one comes out and one goes in. Based upon objective inputs, price and supply and demand. <coughs> Excuse me. It's the irrefutable also of supply and demand and designed to participate in long-term themes of strength. And you know what I think about fundamentals? I think about a funnel. And you can take all the fundamental reports, you can take all the TV personalities, you can take all the recommendations, stuff them down into a funnel, and that answers the question, what? In the end of that funnel, right at the tip, that's price. And that's what price changes. That's why it was so intoxicating for me that first night when I read the, the, the paragraph of the introduction of that book, The Three-Point Reversal Method of Point and Figure uh, Stock Market Trading, written by A.W. Cohen in 1947. That was where the point, that was the point where I really got it. So when we look further here and we say, what is this not? It's not a market forecasting black box. This is not a black box that you can just willy-nilly and, and go with it. There are, you have to be part of the program. That's how you earn your fee. It's not a static strategic indexing strategy. It's not relying upon subjective inputs, gut feel, or manipulated valuation. You find a lot of times when you look at modern portfolio theory and you say, well, we're, we're, we're expecting interest rates to do this, we expect the market to do this, and we expect this to happen, we expect you to put money in it, and here's where you're going to be at retirement. We don't rely on that. Designed to target exact tops and bottoms in security? No, it's not that. There's no way that you can do that. No one can do it. Although if you want to tune in to CNBC or, or any of these other channels or read the business sections, uh, somebody tells you every day where the market has topped. In fact, back probably... Um, 10,000 points ago in, in, in the uh, Dow Jones, people were saying the same thing, get out. The iShares models that we run here, these are sector rotation model. We have a tactical model, iShares international model. Now, the interesting thing about the international model, way back in the year 2000, which, uh, what is that, uh, 16 years ago, is the first time, 18 years, yeah, 18 years ago, 18 years ago, we first came up with our first model for iShares, which was the international model, and we called it country rotation model. We took all the country ETFs and put them into a model, and we've been running it since then. The model concept came to me when I realized that the, the brokerage firms like Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, uh, the rest of them were, were moving towards fee basis and away from commission basis. Away from commission basis meant that it moved away from the basic chart pattern of stocks into something more meaningful where we take those chart patterns and create a model. We now have 80 some different models that run automatically. These are iShares models and one of them in, in, in the year 2002. We've been running it since then. We're probably one of the first ones to create a model. Now it's become 
uh, something that many people do, but we were one of the first ones. Fixed income, also one of the models. So let's look at the iShare sector rotation model. This one's pretty simple. There's your lineup right there. It's 100% invested in equities. Each sector is evaluated against the IYY on a relative strength basis. What does that mean? Every one of these sectors must do an arm wrestling contest against the Dow Jones major market index, IYY, or total market index. It's compared on a relative strength basis. Only funds that are in columns of X's are included. So remember when we looked at the X's and O's on those charts? Those that are in X's will be in the model. Those that are in O's will be out of the model. Plain and simple. Funds are removed when the relative strength reverses into O's. Portfolio is rebalanced with each addition or deletion. So it will remain the same until one of the, the players moves out, and one of the players moves in. It's kind of like a baseball game. You know, you have a pitcher, and all of a sudden the pitcher begins to walk too many people, and there's too many home runs hit on him. And the coach walks out, puts his arm around the pitcher, and says, Hey, Bill, just not your day. Let's go into the dugout, and he takes somebody out of the bullpen, which is another pitcher who's been, been warming up, and puts him on the mound. Same thing happens here. It might be the best way to explain it to a customer. So if we look at the iShares sector rotation model, let's kind of look at what this, see what this looks like. iShares U.S. Consumer uh, Services ETF versus the IYY. You can see it's on a buy signal in a column of X. It will be included. iShares Dow Jones U.S. Financial Services ETF against the IYY. It's in a column of X. It will be included. Next is the IYR, which is real estate, versus the IYY. is in a column of O's. It will be excluded. The iShare sector rotation model current holdings. Notice what we have here is technology, North American technical software, consumer services, Dow Jones financial services, U.S. industrial, U.S. technology, and the Philex semiconductor ETF. The SOX is kind of interesting. That first came out in 1994, and I remember this distinctly. This was the first time that we were able to make a bet, if you will, to make an investment in something that wasn't an, an, an equity, something that was an index type thing. And they came out with the semiconductors, and they also came out with the gold, the XAU, and I think there was software also and a few others. But this was a seminal movement that the Philadelphia Stock Exchange came up with and brought out. In fact, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange brought the first exchange trader fund ever to market, and that was the Cash Index Participation Unit. And I remember traveling around the United States to 25 different venues, educating advisors on how this worked. And the Philex was the first one. I mean, they were the leaders in, in ETFs, first ones to bring them out. And now NASDAQ has purchased the, uh, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. So it's, it's NASDAQ Philex. So notice the equal weight. Let's go back up here one time. Target weighting, notice they're all equal weighted. Now, using RS for asset class comparison, S&P 500, SPX versus Bloomberg AGG. Now, the interesting thing here is we're going to compare the whole list of, of stocks in the, in the inventory. The AGG, the SPX, and, and, and Bloomberg's Barclays Aggregate Bond Index must do a relative strength chart against, the, against itself. And we have, here's where this changes. In the event that the S&P 500 wins that arm wrestling contest on relative strength and is in a column of X's, then you will put 100% of the money available for this tactical um, model in U.S. equities or in the lineup that's available. We'll see that lineup in a moment. In the event that Barclays Aggregate Bond Index wins, 30% of the money goes into the AGG. And 70% goes into the eight that are the top U.S. equities or in that inventory. It's pretty simple, but that has come in really handy, and you're going to see in a moment, like in 2008. Notice the start date here is, is uh, July 31st, 2003, and it's on a buy signal. Therefore, 100% of the money in the tactical is going to go 
into the lineup of U.S. equities that are, are in the fund. Notice the sell signal that takes place here, July 15, 2008. <clears throat> now think back, for those of you that can remember 2008, tough year, and having the ability to move into, put 30% of the portfolio in bonds, the aggregate bond index, was extremely important then. So the S&P during that period of time was down 22%. The SPX uh, in this model or and the AGG was down 0.69, so it kept your money relatively stable in that 30%. Then June 5th, 2009, you'll remember that the market had finally bottomed through that crash in 2008. And actually, April is when it started moving up. But this change in, in June, plenty of time. And you went back to 100% invested in the underlying U.S. equities in this tactical fund. By February 11, 2016, now, now notice, the first thing is notice, June 5, 2009, all the way through to February 11, 2016, is on a buy signal, and U.S. equities have 100% of the available money. February 11th, 2016, for a period of about um, eight months, it, it goes into a sell signal, AGG, in which you would have 30% uh, involved in the AGG, 70% in the lineup, so you have an 18.27% gain SPX, and you lost 0.15, which is, which is almost nothing in the AGG. November 2009, 2000, uh, excuse me, November 9, 2016 to June 30th, 2018 on a buy signal, and you're 100% long uh, the eight items that you would be. So let's take a look and see what we would do here. These are the changes that took place. When you see it in red, that's where you would be 30% AGG. When you see it move into green, you're 100% of the money invested in U.S. equity. <clears throat> iShares tactical model, there's what you have. Notice AGG top. Notice EFA is second. So you have an, an international component here, which is your larger cap uh, international stock. These are not emerging markets. Then you look at the rest of the ETFs that are held in here, and at the bottom, you see commodity index, gold, and silver. They, those, can be, those can be purchased as long as they work their way up to being in the top eight of this whole group. So if AGG wins the relative strength chart again, 30% of the available cash goes into AGG, 70% goes in the top eight. If AGG does not win that arm wrestling contest, then 100% of your money goes in the top eight, plain and simple. And I won't bother reading you on the left-hand side here. We might run out of time. Uh, iShares Tactical Model Equity Matrix. There's the matrix. Now, notice the cell level. Notice that arrow down there. When the top eight are selected to be in it, let's say U.S. Equities has one, you're in the top eight, you will hold those top eight until one of them falls to number 16. If it hits number 16, it comes out, and the next strongest goes in. So let's make a movie here. Let's say, let's say um, iShares U.S. Industrials, IYJ, gets really strong and moves up to the number one point of this whole matrix. You can't put that into the mix until one of the eight falls out. So it's like, again, it's like a baseball game. Let's say the pitcher, you have your, your number one pitcher up there. He's doing okay. He's not doing great. But the, uh, and, and you've got uh, the pitchers that are warming up in the bullpen, and you've got a couple of guys that are just hot as a firecracker, really can't wait to get in. Well, you're not going to take your pitcher off the mound until he finally does enough that the manager can't take it any longer and comes up and brings him off. That's what's going to happen here. So you can find yourself moving out of the one of the uh, iShares, moving out of the top eight, but it's got to get down to 16 before he walks enough people, enough home runs are hit on him, he hits some people with the ball, and the coach goes out there and says, Billy, you got to come off the mound, and then replaces them with the next best one. And that's the best way you can explain it to a customer. Show them a picture of a baseball game. The way you think about this, you know, the way investors really think about investing 
is instead of giving something some time to work, which is, this is longer term in nature, picture a guy is up, is pitching and you start the game. And the first pitch that he throws is a ball. Investors and everybody, get him out. It's clear that his relative strength is going to be negative. He threw a ball the first pitch. Get him off the mound and replace him. You can't do that. You can't do that with portfolios. And you can't do that with this. You have to give it time to work. It may He may do poorly for the first couple of uh, innings and then comes back strong third, fourth, fifth, sixth inning and does great the rest of the game. So we have to give it time. And number 16 is that point at which the coach comes up to the mound and escorts the pitcher off. That's it, plain and simple. iShares Tactical Model Current Holdings, what do we own here? North American Tech Software, iShares S&P 600 Index Fund. This is interesting here. Let's stop at, let's stop at number two, the small cap fund, which is really um, it's the SNL. It's a 600 um, small cap in the S&P, but these aren't small cap stocks. These are, these are like billion-dollar companies. And if you look at the returns of this, you say, when did the market turn to small cap? Well, it turned in October the year 2000. And you look at the returns of that IJR, or you would type in SML to go back to 2000, astronomical. You're talking about 475% return for the last uh, 18 years versus the S&P cap weight, maybe 70% return. So small caps have been the play. Periodically, larger caps have moved in, moved in. Of, of last couple of years, the small cap um, has waned a little bit, but still it, ha- it, it, it has a favorable return versus the S&P uh, 500. Consumer services next, IHI medical devices. Now this is going to, these are going to stay. <clears throat> it's my opinion. I think these medical devices, biotechnology, are really coming on strong here. The medical devices, small companies that are making some of the most unique things for healthcare, um, I just don't see these falling out. Of course, you have to wait and see how the system works, but in my opinion, I think medical is, is a place to be. Broker dealers and security ETFs, IAI, regional banks, aerospace and defense, done extremely well this year, and semiconductors. SOX, there's the SOX again, and... Um, that's been around since 1994. <clears throat> Let's look at the returns. The returns for the iShare sector rotation model for, from 2003 are up 307% versus IYY 254 and S&P up 231. Tactical model, almost the same thing, up 319% versus 254 versus 231. So immediately I look at these and then what does it mean to me? I think of a portfolio like like the sun and the planets. What's my sun? What's the core position that I'm going to have? And many of you might have some sort of modern portfolio theory as a core position. The planets, though, what are your planets that are going to surround the sun? These might be two planets. I mean, the sun might be in the center there, and I own the iShares tactical model. I own the iShares sector model. They have different returns. Some years, it makes absolute sense to have those circling the sun. And some other ones that you could put in there, too. But I think that's the way I would be managing. That's why I do manage portfolios, plain and simple. And that's it for me. I want to thank you all for listening, and I'm going to turn it back over. Hey, Tom, thank you very much for your insights and comments and, and um, everything that you've done, not only today, but for the past uh, 45 years of clients. And uh, Jeff, as, as we wrap up here, uh, do you want to tell us again where investors can learn more about the different model portfolios that, uh, that Tom just ran through? Sure, Tony. I just want to thank Tom. What a privilege to hear the guru himself on Relative Strength Index and really uh, take us through from uh, the first inning to the ninth inning. We get so excited that KKM Financial now has the ability as we're licensing these ETF models, the four ETF models that are constructed with iShares. We have the ability to offer these as a custodian. We also have a fully automated platform at kkmmodels.com, and we're on a variety of different camps. So if you have any questions on how we can deliver these investable ETF model portfolios, which Tom just ran through and did a wonderful job, please feel free to reach out to info at kkmfinancial.com or go to the website, which is kkmmodels.com. But again, Tom, 
fantastic job. We really appreciate you breaking down the relative strength in investing. My pleasure. Anytime. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and Jeff and Tom, if you, if you don't mind, we've got a couple of minutes here. Uh, we had a couple of questions come in, uh, and I thought I'd throw them out to you. Does that sound good? Yeah, sure. Wonderful. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, first question was, uh, as U.S. equity markets continue to make new all-time highs, is this possibly an environment where a sector rotation strategy could prevail? Well, I think a sector rotation strategy is going to prevail no matter what. Uh, whether the U.S. market makes new highs or begins to wane somewhat, I think when you focus on what are the pieces of the market that are doing extremely well. I mean, if you look at look at our models and you see, if you look at biotechnology, that's up 38% uh, so far this year. So, yeah, you, you definitely want to go in there and take the pieces of the whole, look at them, and be in the right place at the right time. Keep in mind the relative strength is long-term. This is not overnight stuff, uh, but it will keep your foot in the stirrup much longer term in nature. And I don't think about, you know, people ask me, I gave a talk the other night at a club in town here, and I was asked, Tom, do you think the market is at, is, is, is at a high? Should we begin to get word? No. Heck no. Because, you know, if, if I thought the market was any point in high, when I started this business, I, it was at 500. That was at 500. Where is it now? And we've been through everything you can think of in the kitchen sink thrown at us from 9-11 to Iraq to ending Vietnam, on and on. So there's no necessary talk. What's the, what's the ver I hear people talk about fair valuation for the stock. To me, the fair valuation is what someone's willing to pay for it. That's it, plain and simple. Remember in the – never forget this. They came up with new ways of looking at fundamentals during the dot-com craze. I mean, pro forma earnings. They couldn't, they couldn't come out with – they couldn't do things the way they used to. Came out with pro forma earnings. How the company would do if it didn't have all this other stuff encumbered around its neck. I mean, so forget about those things. If there are more buyers and sellers willing to sell, price will rise. If there are more sellers yeah. and buyers willing to buy, price will decline. And just to add on to that, what Tom said, he's absolutely right. But just to add on to from the sector perspective, I think mean, let's look at the last decade, Tony. The last decade, indexes have prevailed. And I think now is the time. I've talked to a lot of different advisors across the country. And they're really looking for the sector rotation model. I think the iShares sector rotation model provides that solution. And it is going to be a time to kind of drift away from the indexes prevailing and actually have a sector tilt inside the portfolio. I think it's going to make a big difference in the next couple of years. And that's I think the solution in these investable ETF model portfolios are going to provide to advisors like yourself. Well, thank you, Jeff. I think that makes a lot of sense. Another question kind of along the same lines, but in fixed income, uh, came in and said, uh, does using relative to strength methodology inside of fixed income allocation make sense now as U.S. Treasury rates are on the rise? Uh, yeah, well, absolutely, because, you know, in, in, in the U.S. fixed income, you can go as far as uh, convertible bonds. You can go short-term, long-term, all term. kinds of different ways. Yes, absolutely. You want to look at the fixed – you want to slice and dice that fixed income up as much as you can. And then look at which ones have the best relative strength, which ones don't. If the rates rising, they could turn right around and start declining again. Who knows? Not true. Too. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think if you look at the universe, Tony, of the I share six income, wow, that universe is pretty diverse. Tom, point. See it inside the asset class, the tilt toward the tilt. We talk about the relatively. Be aware of that as we see the 10 year note looking to stay above 3%. And I see that short end of the curve. That's going to provide a lot of opportunities. So I think the iShares fixed income model does provide that solution as in a raising right, raising right environment. Sounds good. Any uh, uh, last uh, thoughts from either of you as far as uh, where we are in the marketplace and uh, today's market before we wrap up? Yes. In the words of JP Morgan, it will fluctuate. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. That's, that's, great. All, we, that's all we know. That's right. That's, that's right. right. I saw Tom's sentiment earlier, Tony. I really say, you know, as advisors are listening to this wonderful webinar, I think it's the time to be necessary to your clients. And I think when you look at your advisory business, it's all about simplifying and also scaling. And I think if you can utilize these ETF model portfolios to help you accomplish those two goals of simplifying and scaling your business, here's the solution. These are wonderful models. They, you know, the, the research is out there for 16 years. Tom's been doing this for 45 years. So I think these solutions should help the smaller advisor as well as the larger advisor continue to simplify and scale their business. 
Let me throw Ready? one more thing in here at the end. You know, we're talking about the iShares model, uh, fixed income. Look at what's in there. iShares uh, high-yield corporate bonds, um, global high-yield corporate bonds, international high-yield bonds, uh, international treasury bonds. Notice how we've gone the international flavor here and uh, the one to three year uh, treasury bonds. So you got a lot of different stuff there and you got an international flavor that I bet you don't have in, uh, in others. That's right. Nope. And then um, one last, one last question we'll wrap up with here is uh, what is a typical turnover in a portfolio and how do you avoid the whipsaw effect? I'm not sure what you would say is a relative turnover in a portfolio. It depends on who's managing it and what has happened here. I don't have an answer for that. The Scott, whipsaws, more the whipsaws, I'm sorry. sorry Tom, go ahead. No, the whipsaws are going to happen periodically. That's life. Because if you didn't get the whipsaws, uh, it would be pretty simple to come to work. You just, you just put your foot in the stirrup and ride forward and everything would be great. And, uh, but the whipsaws do, do happen. So you have to deal with it. And that's why you make yourself necessary to your customer. The longer term picture of relative strength is going to prevent you from getting too many of those whipsaws. But that's going to be a fact of life, plain and simple. That's, that's great. So let me, um, one little housekeeping item before I wrap up. Uh, reminder to all participants who are interested in receiving uh, CFP, CE credits for today's webinar. Please send your CFP ID number, your name, your firm name, and send that all directly to dwa at nasdaq.com. That's D is in David, W is in Washington, A is in Anthony, at nasdaq.com so that we can submit the credit on your behalf. So uh, Jeff and Tom, thanks again. We're excited to be partnered uh, with both Jeff and Tom and NASDAQ to bring advisors and their clients the technology and insights to help them save time help you scale your business and better serve your clients in helping them reach a better financial future. So thanks everyone for your time today and we'll talk to you soon.